so we should probably start with hello. Yeah, hello. Hi. So, uh, this happened. Yeah. Uh, the, by, the, by this, the what do you mean? Is a lot, is a, upon us. Oh, oh, the apocalypse. Yeah, the apocalypse definitely happened. Um, it would have happened either way, I think, but whatever. Yeah, so we been talking about doing a podcast for a bit and just maybe once a week chat some rubbish about whatever's been happening. I mean, but ben, ben doesn't watch the news or anything, so I occasionally send him something. Yes, it's like, Luke something. sends me things that he thinks will antagonise me, and he knows me well enough um, to be successful most of the time. Um, and then we start arguments about it, and we thought, well, if we recorded these, they might be of some amusement to people with very strange tastes in what they watch on the internet. Yeah. So, hi. So, in that vein... Uh, yeah, basically, I was, yesterday I was watching the news, and there was an interview with... I wasn't. No, you weren't. But I relayed to Ben uh, a video where Peter Hitchens was mm. uh, basically giving his view about... Um, sorry, there's a cat out somewhere in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, about the, basically the state of politics and how the two parties um, no longer represent the real divides in the country. Mm, how, yes. yeah, maybe, so both, both of the main parties' votes were split on this issue, so... Yeah, yeah this isn't just a, uh, you know, the usual sort of politicians are out of touch sort of comment. This is more to do with the fact that the, you know, the political divide between the parties that are meant to represent a real divide between the voters no longer represent that division. Yeah. There are new divisions, multiple new divisions, and because both parties are split on those divisions, they don't represent a real divide <laughs> in yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah, so basically we thought we'd talk about what are the real divisions in the country nowadays and uh, yeah. what would new parties look like yeah. if they represented those differences. Yeah, if you could make two yeah. new parties. Yeah. What would and their what, policies yeah. be? What would they have to what would they have to disagree over to yeah. represent the real disagreement so that we have felt like we had a choice between those who agree with us and those who don't, rather than what it feels like now, which is more like two groups who don't really agree or disagree with us on anything because they don't represent the right debates. Yeah, they basically <laughs> all agree on the big stuff issues. that we disagree about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all disagree on stuff that we all agree about. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we're taking sort of the, the, the Brexit stats as sort of our sort of yeah, guide loose, here a bit. Loose evidence. Yeah, loose, loose evidence for where the real divisions are in the country, <coughs> politically. Yeah, so, so, so what, yeah, what a leave vote means or what a remain vote means and what, what yeah. this year is, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, so, issue, the, yeah the, the real issues that are kind of motivating people to vote to leave or remain. Yeah, because it used to be... Because, okay, I think that we should do some sort of... A slight sort of gloss on the history, right? Because, you know, traditionally... What was it? Sort of Labour represented workers, I guess. Hence yeah. Labour Party, you know. And, you know, Tories, Conservatives, whatever you want to call them, represent... What would you call it? <laughs> middle classes and middle off. class and elites, I yeah, guess, yeah. in a way, and that, and that and that was the big divide, um, almost entirely a class divide, yeah. I think, um, and an economic divide. I think yeah, um, there were big like economic arguments. As yes, well, like left and left and right was still yeah, left the, and right was entirely issue. yeah, and left and right was entirely in terms of left and right co economics. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so the left would be, you know, Labour, and it would be more, more welfare focused. And it was like union nationalisation of. Like yeah. Everything. The right was yes. more about privatisation. Pri 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 yeah. and, and that that's markets. that's the, that's the divide that these parties used to represent, and that represented a real divide among the electorate. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're going to look at the real divides as they exist now, because they're very different. A little bit of a bit of similarity, but there's certainly a lot more divides now. Yeah. Uh, divides along whole new lines and new dimensions that these old politics don't capture. Yeah. yeah. So. Or, or as we boldly claim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <We're not laughs> <wrong. laughs> 
that's it. Yeah, sorry, we're we're both ill, so <laughs> we're both ill. We're... <laughs> at the same time yeah. in different cities. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully you can still hear us. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. So number one, I think uh, Im- immigration. Immigration. Pretty, uh, yeah. Views on immigration. Yep. Um, I don't think anyone's going to seriously deny that immigration is a is a massive issue and a yeah. dividing issue mm. in the country right now. That seems like a platitude. Um. So what is the disagreement? I guess the disagreement is just more or less or you know none or lots or <laughs> yeah none or less but still some <laughs> yeah so i think basically both parties sort of agree on some or quite a lot but pretend otherwise yeah. some of them uh, <laughs> yes even even Brexit, you know, with the whole, um, oh yes, we'll be able to finally get control of our borders promise, which is within 24 hours of them actually winning, I think, was almost completely retracted. Yeah, well, they're um, saying we'll have control, but we won't we'll still have lots more. Them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll still have lots of immigration because guess what? We need it yeah. economically. Um, so why would we, you know, I mean, we just don't have, we need access to a, a global labor market because we don't have the necessary skills and personnel to do to run the entire country ourselves yeah, uh, we have, have an age, aging population so we have an aging population crisis so we need young workers yep. and we have, we have we yep and we're not raising people with or educating people with skills as much as we used to hmm. um, because we have no manufacturing base anymore, so <laughs> we, we have a reasonable one we we are, we, 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 we overestimate how bad the manufacturing is but we don't we're not we, we, we used to be, yeah, we used to be very industrial and, and yeah, coal we used miners. Yeah, you know? high skill, industrial. <laughs> yes, and we don't steal now. coal mining jobs. Um, now we raise, you know, bankers and, yeah. and um, you know, the service industry and um, people who design user interfaces for your for your iPhones, uh, <laughs> all that stuff. So we 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 yeah we need a we need access to a, a global labour market. So it's not really going to go down. I think, um, I think we need access. We need to be able to go and work elsewhere, right? Because sort of global companies have mm. headquarters all over the world, and yeah, yeah. The the increasing um, internationality and transnationality of uh, business itself means yeah. that you know any country that denies its own workers, you know, access to a, a globalized market is doing itself wrong yeah you know it's we're, we're trying to do business like we're still like we're still w- we're operating 50 years ago mm-hmm. you know but the the labor market has changed corporations have changed uh trade has changed so yeah. we need to change with it simple yeah, so, argument so i think there's in the country there's definitely a difference in perception about the pros and cons of immigration Mm-hmm. Yep. So uh, you have you have one group of people who think um, immigration is putting a lot of pressure on uh, social services like uh, uh-huh. yep. schools, healthcare, etc. Yep. And uh, it's driving down uh, wages for low low skilled jobs. Yep. And, then and you it's have the other side who think we need we need immigrants to. Yeah gaps in the economy etc yes and like like most political divides it's a bit um sort of over polarized because the reality is some subtle compromise between the two views mm-hmm. you know the the reality is that you know to some extent i mean the country definitely needs some degree of immigration to function yeah. quite a lot at the moment it turns out um as we just said but um i mean there are downsides for some people you know people in certain uh, areas of industry people in certain parts of the country are probably losing out um we won't 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 talk too much about that but um there are people who suffer as a result of immigration and those people yeah there are real pressures on public services and housing yeah yeah when it comes to public services though i think a really important point is that 
you know, again, we have an aging population, <laughs> and actually, a lot of the pressure that we get on, especially the NHS, is a consequence of oh, that. Old people, yeah. Yes, it's <laughs> so the the old generation, Luke, <laughs> not old people, <laughs> the 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 less firm uh, <laughs> members of society are. Um, the ones who are really exhausting the resources of the NHS, and it's and then the irony is that we need all of the uh, the migrant uh, doctors and nurses mm -hmm. to look after them, <laughs> yeah. uh, because their their grandchildren are few and not trained <laughs> to correct skills. Yeah. So yeah, that's a there's an irony there. Okay, we are wrapping up this bit. I guess we are. Yeah. We have done, are we? Don't we, yeah, don't we want to go into too much detail, but yeah, that's that, that's that's a major divide nowadays. That the so I don't think we've been clear enough yet though about why exactly we think this isn't well represented by the existing parties, right? Is it because I think you you briefly said that they they both they, basically agree on having immigration. Yeah, I think they've not talked about it as much. Like yeah, they're afraid of being before, perceived. Before the referendum, I don't think this was really talked about much at all. Mm. It's only, it's it's, only it's, been talked talk about in the context of the referendum, right? Yeah, yeah, and and they're still afraid to talk about it. No, no one wants to come out and say there are genuine disadvantages to immigration. I think because I think then it, everyone think they, thinks they're they racist. Kind of, they kind of <laughs> want to be seen to be in control of it and tough on it, but yeah. not actually doing anything about it, right? Yeah, it's very, very hard to be tough on them. <coughs> you know, it's it's hard to have the resources to do that. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, they kind of don't want to be tough on it because they know they need it. They don't want to discourage people. Yeah. Yeah, I also kind of think it's also the problems or the, the downsides are exaggerated due to sort of austerity and cuts to funding for NHS and schools, etc., and lack of house yeah. building anyway. Well, it's the, the desire to find a scapegoat, right? This is usually what happens to uh, uh, minority ethnicities and whatnot. Um, whenever something whenever something goes goes awry, you just blame the outgroup. <laughs> and politicians, um, some politicians will capitalise on, you know, waving their finger at that group and saying they're to blame. Focus your anger on them. Don't focus it on the the people who um, yes. made the de made the political <laughs> decisions, made the yeah. economic decisions that ruined you, um, you know, anger it directed at somebody who isn't us, <laughs> somebody convenient, <coughs> <laughs> um, yeah. and we're just succumbing to that, you know. Um, yeah, so I think this this is probably the biggest issue for the referendum. You say. Yeah, I think that yeah, the vast majority of people who vote leave are voting for purposes of you know getting back control of the borders or something. Yeah. Um, whatever they think that's going to do. Okay. So. And not like we say, not along the traditional lines of, you know, Labour versus Conservative. Yeah. <laughs> They're voting along the lines of immigration, pro or con. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Our second divide is welfare and mm. the role of the state in the role of the state, yeah, and uh, work ethic and yeah, yeah. So I think there's this this kind of sort of is re represented to some extent between, well, it's at least perceived that there is a difference between the Tories and Labour on this. Um, yeah, yeah Labour sort of seen as soft and too quick to hand out um, yes. benefits and too, or, or too, always too spending benefits. too much money on welfare and yes yeah. yeah and then borrowing to pay for it and then they will blame the economic situation on that yeah yeah and that the toys are seen as more it's like more tough and more <coughs> less, less yes. generous yeah so I think you can sort of vaguely associate sort of the idea of a work ethic with the Tories, and say, yeah, yeah I think that that's, that's definitely, that's, definitely what's, what's there. Yeah. So you're, you're not supposed to. You don't. You don't just get given stuff. You don't just live on handouts. You have to work, and if you don't, you shouldn't get anything. Yeah, well, they say um, work, because you have working, to pull your weight. Yeah, working out of poverty or something like. Yes. So this yeah, is work the, your this way is out of poverty. The whole yeah. Philosophy, right? Yes. This is well. Yeah. It's 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 all <coughs> politics. <laughs> it's the, 
the somewhat outdated view now that the best way to end unemployment is to, or reduce unemployment at least, is to give people no choice but to work. Um, whereas we know, I mean, statistically, it's just more effective to actually support people and make them feel less alienated and, and less useless and and uh, make them feel like their society is actually supporting them. And then they are sufficiently motivated to go out and find work because they want to contribute and pay back what they've taken. Mm -hmm. And it turns out in every social experiment we've run, uh, that's been the case, contrary to what many people in the country believe. Uh, and that's the divide, I guess. And those who believe in, you know, that approach to unemployment, um, you know, welfare, mm -hmm. <laughs> helping people, uh, having a safety net that everyone can call upon, and those who believe in, uh, a, you know, like you say, a sort of harsher, less even-handed yeah, kind of it's, approach. It's also like a. Um, so I think they believe in this. They believe that um, in like lower taxes because they want. It's like their money. They've, they've yeah. it. they don't want to give away their money. Don't give it to someone who didn't earn it. Yeah, who, how, how dare they have it? You know. And yes, they, I they could. see like I don't know. It's a less. I think Sorry. You, you see, it, you see it as less less part of a community, right? If it's your mm. like, you go to work, you earn your money. You yes. Pay for your your kids to go to school. Yes. Like you, you feel like you owe. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously a division when it comes to the welfare division. There's obviously a division between, you know, the more versus less ecocentric mm -hmm. outlook on life. You know, those who say, I earned this money and it belongs to me and no one else has a right to it. And mm -hmm. those who say, I earned this money um, and I can put it to good use for others. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, um, we all benefit if we all cooperate. Mm -hmm. If we all pay what we can, then everyone is elevated collectively. Um, versus, you know, I'm going to get whatever I can out of life and no one else is allowed any of it because they didn't earn it. Yeah. Uh, two very different approaches yeah. to ownership and um, the role of money and what you're supposed mm -hmm. to do with it. Yeah, Hoard it, the Hoard the it or invest it. Right. <laughs> yeah, and the role of the state. Yes, does, does the state have the right to kind of redistribute your wealth and your produce? Uh, for the benefit of the collective, or should it just keep its nose out of your business and let you sit back and prosper, mm -hmm. <laughs> or fail? You know, uh, it's more kind of. I guess they would. I guess they. Some people would characterise it as though, you know, one side is more sort of social Darwinian, in its attitude. Mm -hmm. It's more about uh, you're free to succeed. You're also free to fail, mm -hmm. um, and that's the way it ought to be. And then everyone gets there. Everyone gets what they deserve. Everyone gets mm -hmm. what they earn. And no more and no less, and they they think that's fair. Mm -hmm. I think that's part part of their mentality. They think that that's a fair deal, um, rather than I think the other side's thinking of it as what is the best overall state of affairs for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, um, regardless of who's making what, regardless of where it's coming from, uh, or what's fair, <laughs> right? Maybe fairness is overrated. Maybe it's just a matter of what's best. <laughs> You know, what what produces the happiest, most prosperous world? Um, yeah, I think that's a bit. That's a really, really fundamental difference yeah, I think in psychology. Is, I think this one is probably of the ones we've got. It's best represented by the two parties at the minute as well. Yeah. Yes, of all, of all the things we've, we we yeah. were talking about today, um, labour look more like. Um, the best world for the labourers, <laughs> mm -hmm. and Tories are more sort of. This is what we own. Don't take it from us. <laughs> yeah. 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 Did you you want to talk about the um, robots? <laughs> the robots. Yes. Um, as we all know, the robot revolution is coming, and our time is limited. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and this, as far as I can tell, is a good thing. Uh, <laughs> this is about the automation of industry and bureaucracy at least, and maybe one day the automation of everything, uh, or almost everything, yeah. um, and the, 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 the declining need to work in the modern world. Um, you know, we produce a surplus in terms of goods, food, um, and, you know, with increasing technology and innovation, and if you solve the energy crisis and whatever, um, 
we ought to be able to produce a world where work is almost entirely defunct, or at least definitely not as necessary as it is now, yeah. um, where only a fraction of the population ever needs to work any given time to produce enough, and everything else is automated, and you know, uh, and we learn not to live quite so excessively, so it, it's more fairly distributed as well. Um, yeah. I mean, so the robot cars are coming pretty soon. Yes, <laughs> robot and cars. This, and this is going to... Um, yeah, it's going to threaten the jobs that, of yeah, that's taxi all, drivers. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, delivery men. Yeah, yeah. Uh, white van men, men with men. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah basically a whole, a whole lot of jobs. Yeah, could be done by a, robots. As what happens throughout history, when technology improves and certain things aren't required anymore, um, what we're talking about is that you know more is that we might finally be approaching a point, or we very likely are approaching a point where work as such is no longer required. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we get to the point where everything is manufactured automatically, houses are 3D printed, whatever. Yeah. Um, 3D printed in the factory. Re renew renewable energy. <laughs> in the yeah. 3D pr 3D printed in the factory that is self-sustaining. Yeah, and then you loaded know, onto uh, a robot lorry. Onto, yeah, self-driving <laughs> lorries and then delivered and yeah, everything's fine. Um, bare minimum of human input required and of course in the wake of that change which is gradual and that's the problem mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the world has to adapt by creating more jobs so that we can pay people <laughs> so yeah. that they can buy food so that they don't starve um, and there's going to be a difference a huge divide here connected to what we were just talking about between those who think yes that's good you know in the future people won't have to work anymore um, or they'll have to work very very little to produce enough for everyone uh, enough to go around and everyone just gets what they need whether they work or not you think there'll be um, there'll be like a citizen's in income right where yes be a, we, we, we already have talk of basic income in certain countries you know yeah. uh, especially in scandinavian countries you know the possibility of basic income has become a real political issue there yes yeah, so um, everyone this, gets this what is, they need. so the state will give you yeah a, certain, a living a wage amount of money which yeah. is enough for you to feed yourself yeah. and yeah. pay your rent and you get that whether you work or not yeah um, at the moment, that that's actually a way of dealing with unemployment because it mm -hmm. turns out that if you do this for people, um, they're actually more likely to find work, not less, because they don't need to worry about money all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they might, they um, might do, they might take up you know free caring jobs or yep, make yep. The, they have the freedom to the, the yeah. sort of, they take the risk to start a business or something like this. I think like. I think statistically, I've actually seen um, a lot of people actually take on jobs that make less money. Than the than what they were getting paid for free, mm -hmm. because they'd rather be working and feel like they're contributing, mm -hmm. than be taking the free money from the government. So mm -hmm. it, it works that way as well. Mm -hmm. But in the future, the idea is that a basic income uh, won't just be there to tackle unemployment, right? It'll be there won't be any need for you to be employed because most of it's automated anyway. Yeah. You know, um, and yeah, then so everyone just gets what they need, and then you can work if you want. You know, you can yeah. and you can do things that aren't necessary. Like you, you can do the arts, and you can, you know, you can sell <coughs> You know, whatever you want to do. Be a hairdresser. I don't know stuff that isn't strictly speaking necessary to our survival that you can do. But you no longer need to worry about making money out of it because you're already getting all you need from the automated industry. Yep. Yeah, so you yeah. think there'll be there'll be a divide in the country? A huge divide from those who say yes, that's good, and those yeah. who say no, no everyone needs to work to earn their living. Work. Otherwise, why should they get anything? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll let you guess which side I'm on. <laughs> yeah, so, Wink. <laughs> so we'll have the pro robot party and the, the pro robot party anti and the anti robot party, um, and then there'll be the whole issue of uh, robot migrants <laughs> <laughs> and having access to a global labour force of automated robots. <laughs> yeah. So was it our next one is? I put Brit Britain's place in the world. And Britain's place in the world, yeah. I guess more generally it's, yeah. Globalisation. Sort of the role of nations, yeah. I guess, in a way. Um, yeah, take this one away. I'm yeah, going to so I think there's, yeah, part of the country that's really sort of patriotic and likes the idea of Britain, thinks Britain's great, and then another part who kind of, as they feel more European or you know, a citizen of Europe or a citizen of the world. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. So those who um, 
um, a kind think of national identity is like important. And yes, that's yeah, that's that's, that's what we're saying. It, like, yeah, like those who think national identity is important. Should be kept and yeah, like and and it relates to things like immigration because um, it's it's those who think that you put your own people first. You know, yeah. you give jobs to British people, British jobs to British people, that kind of thing. Um, because there's something important about those are those identities. You know, there's something important about the fact that you are British, you were born here, you have you have a right to live here, you have a right to these jobs. Um, you're not just a citizen of the world moving around wherever that happens to be work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, versus the uh, people who think uh, no, it's just a it's just a free market, a free global market. You go wherever there is work. Um, you don't give jobs to your own people first. You just give jobs. <laughs> yeah, I think that yeah, this is definitely yeah, definitely not represented in the two parties. Maybe we have mm. conservatives maybe try and be a bit more patriotic and stuff. But I think you have you have the same from from Labour as well, sort of from a different angle. Yeah, that might though again be sort of an aging population thing because. You know, we haven't. We've talked a lot about the aging population. We haven't talked much about the young vote yet. You know, the other side of the coin, which is that you know, the young are a minority, but they um, radically disagree with the the old on most things, yeah. <laughs> um, creating a, a bizarre dem democratic um, <laughs> situation where those with the most life left to live in the country have the least say over what that life is going to be like. Yeah, I, I think it's also the case that. Older people are more likely to vote as well, right? Yes, more, yes. More uh, so. And I think in part that's because the old people are more likely to have their agreements and disagreements represented by the old yeah. parties. Yeah. And the new people find that all these new issues that are coming up um, are not represented by those parties at all on either side. Um, or rather that they can't choose between them on these issues because they don't represent the right divides. Mm -hmm. uh, they well, don't disagree over the right might, things. There might be one party they agree with on one thing and one on... Yes, on yes. So it's not... Yeah. They want something more representative of them, so they don't vote either. Um, but the um, the issue of, of yeah, I think that the young have grown up in a world that is a lot more flexible um, in terms of you know borders, the economy. It's more globalized, um, so it makes sense that they would be more. Um, more interested in a, a, a freer yeah. movement of labour and resources and the erosion of national identity. Yeah, I think they, uh, they go to study university and they see... More and more of them go to yeah. study at university and, and they, they go they, to they, very they, multicultural climates at yeah. university. I mean, they see people from Europe studying here, st yep. like studying abroad and like yep. sort of see opportunities. And there's lots of, there are lots of people there who are multilingual mm -hmm. <laughs> and lots, lots of people there who have different... Um, cultural backgrounds, racial backgrounds, economic backgrounds, mm -hmm. and they, yeah, and they just, they just have a much more globalized attitude. You see what I mean? They, they have a much more, they probably know a lot more people from elsewhere in the world, and they know of the rest of the world much more through mm -hmm. those people. Um, and the older generation who are just have disproportionate economic, uh, disproportionate uh, economic and democratic power and influence in our country don't have that kind of modernised, globalised experience. Yeah, do you think there's, there's, there wasn't sort of the cheap flights and stuff that... There no, are, there's not. yeah. And so it makes sense that they would have a greater sense of national identity in a way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they are almost kind of, almost just as a matter of geography, <laughs> you know, and geographic uh, barriers and obstacles to travel and whatnot. They are British, I you know, maybe, as maybe opposed to anywhere that. else. <laughs> I guess they probably assume it's more different than it is. People are more different than they are yeah. in the world, right? Yeah, they don't meet them, and it's 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 easy to um, believe stereotypes, for example, about people you've never met. Mm -hmm. uh, if you haven't actually yeah. interacted with a culture, it's easy for you to generalise them. If you actually go to university campuses or whatever, or you work in a hospital or something, you know, and you see people from all over the world, um, you see. You don't just see you don't you don't just see oh they're all okay really. What you see is more like oh some of them are arseholes and some of them are quite nice. <laughs> you know some of them you agree with some of them you don't and you see uh, the diversity within each culture the individuality. 
and you don't you can't hold on to the stereotypes anymore because you it, it, it's much harder to hold on to the stereotypes because you can't generalize anymore uh, any more than you would with your own people um, what about uh so this last one i'm not convinced is a big divide but ben was convinced so i'll let him talk about it. Is this like so, in... social attitudes and liberalism and oh no no I thought, I thought you were talking about intellectualism um, right. <laughs> no um, social attitudes liberalism oh right yes this is the whole sort of things like acceptance of you know non heteronormative sexuality and stuff like that mm -hmm. sort of sexual liberation and that sort of thing yeah basically I, think, I, I, I was, I, I was I, under the impression that we were all pretty settled on this we're all past this it's all, it's pretty all in the past yeah then. and i think there's some truth to that in the sense that in the younger generation of which we yeah. are both a part more or less <laughs> some, one of us slightly more than the other <laughs> um that in our generation it's it's settled i mean we we try not to be racist we try not to be sexist we try uh not to be homophobic we try to be tolerant of all forms of life uh, and 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 whatever um, but I think it's a lot more of a deal with the older generation than Luke does. I think the older generation are actually um, against a lot of these lifestyles, <laughs> which I put in scare quotes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think they view you know a lot of sexualities as just perverse. I think they view a lot of lifestyle choices as illegitimate and they're not tolerant of diversity at all. And they're very, very skeptical about things like, you know, transgender, transsexuality. Um, and if they had a party that said, we'll get rid of all that, <laughs> they might be very tempted to vote for it. No, you think so? Um, yeah, I think that, I think it's weird that um, the parties we have now, even the parties we have now, you know, Labour and Conservative, Lib Dem were annihilated, <laughs> um, are, um, Sort yeah, of pandering is... to the youth, even though the youth don't have that much role and that, that much authority democratically because they're a minority and they don't vote very much. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to, no politician today wants to look homophobic or sexist or whatever, and it's, it's catastrophic for them if they do, because mm -hmm. that's how it's perceived. But I think that if you actually spoke to a lot of uh, older people in the country, they probably think exactly the same thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. <coughs> We disagree on whether that's a. Yeah, I think so. I think, so it's, we, I think it's a generational divide. I think it's a real divide, and that, it, and that if political parties really represented it, there'd be a party for the old people and another party for the young people. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's sort of it's sort of made to be. Uh, so the cat just nearly fell off the fence. <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> Stop watching the cat. We're not yeah, doing sorry. a cat video, okay? I know it's the it's internet. Cat, but we're cat not watch. doing a cat video. <laughs> cat watch so, would get a lot more views than this. <laughs> yeah, so we. Uh, when we were trying to come up with a list of issues, it was like, what could you potentially start an argument with someone in the pub talking about? <laughs> I think this, I think, yeah, you probably, I think there probably are more people who feel like the old people, but wouldn't say so, or wouldn't that on Yeah, right? they wouldn't say so. But if the climate were different and it was more representative, and that's the point of this discussion, right? If, mm -hmm. if politics was more representative of what the people in Britain actually believe and where the disagreements lie, I think that you would get homophobic journalists, homophobic, I mean, a lot more than you do now, and they wouldn't be pariahs. Mm. They were just, they were representing, you know, what was perceived as a legitimate political ideology. Mm. They'd have a more traditional attitude, more traditional sexual attitudes, more traditional social attitudes in general. Um, because lots of people in the country still do feel like that. A lot more than we experience because we're young and we went so to university. I suppose the, um, yeah, the gay marriage stuff was mm. that was seen as Cameron sort of forcing yeah. through, wasn't it? It was. It wasn't. It wasn't obvious. Yeah, it wasn't. It, was, it wasn't. It was, wasn't uncontroversial. Even though for our generation, it was totally uncontroversial, right? It was just yeah. why the hell not? I mean, right. I mean, there was there was like opposition, right? It wasn't. It wasn't. Universally... Yeah. Even in a country where it's that, you know. Um, politically incorrect mm. to voice opposition even then there was outspoken opposition to it and it was and it was hard mm. to force through it was it required effort it wasn't just 
uh, it wasn't the kind of uh, um, a smooth transition into a new time. You know, mm. just catch keeping up with the ages. It was a yeah, was it? Yeah, it felt was like, like, yeah. like that for us, but it wasn't yeah. like that politically because there are people out there who hugely disagree on this. So this is a weird. This is weird, like I say, because the old the the older people, the elderly. I was going to say, mm. <laughs> the the the, the pre millennial generations, mm. right? Um, are the ones who I think have these these attitudes, right? Um, less liberal attitudes, less accepting, less tolerant attitudes. And they actually have the most power. They have the most money, and they have the most influence. They have the most votes. Yeah, these these. Um, and uh, yet, like... the politicians mm. are pandering to us, who have far less power, and making it politically incorrect to, to express these points of view that are probably probably more common than ours are. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, it's odd. Mm. So that's that's why I think it's it's a topic for this for this discussion because. The parties aren't representing that disagreement. Yeah. They're all just assuming that the young people are uh, voicing the common sense opinion. But it's it's obvious that they're not, because when you try and push through gay marriage, everyone says no. I um, think it was it was it was it wasn't it went through reasonably easy, but there was still yeah. more opposition than yeah. you'd yeah. expect. Yeah. And I imagine there there would be there would be even more if if they were representative, because mm. there would be a lot more politicians speaking out against it, because that's still the divide but like i say it's a weird one because it's a divide that will die out when mm. some people die out <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> when, when they literally <laughs> die out <laughs> it won't be a divide anymore so it's not it's kind it's sort of a it's sort of relevant to this conversation this discussion that we're having but it's also kind of not because we're talking about sort of like a new politics mm -hmm. a future politics where the new divides are represented and this divide while it isn't represented currently won't exist by the time <laughs> It should be, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, how do you think these issues will sort of, how do you think a party will stand on each of these issues? Like which ones will join, come together? Which, which, will, which will unite, yeah. yeah. Um, I th uh, it, it's almost, it, it sounds almost too obvious to be correct, right? But I, I want to be able to say um, mostly pro-immigration will also be mostly pro-globalized attitude, mm -hmm. right? It'll be more sort of people who are more um, pro the free movement of labor around mm -hmm. the world will have a less... Um, a less territorial view yeah. of the world, mm -hmm. um, and they'll be more, they'll have a more globalized attitude. Mm -hmm. um, that seems, that, if that wasn't the case, I'd, I'd ask why, and it'd be interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> to see <Yeah>. why. <laughs> yeah. That seems like it's obvious. Um, what about? Um, Do you think they'll also be pro-robot mm. and pro welfare? Yeah, that's pro-robot. Okay, so pro robot <laughs> slash welfare because they're the same thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> will also uh, be socially liberal. Socially liberal. Mm. Uh, see, my instinct no, was, to, could... was to say yes because they over, they tend to, you know, they tend to correlate, right? But I that's only because they if correlate you, if in you young people. Sort of out, outward looking, mm. uh, like nationhood wise. I, I, guess, I guess okay maybe this is something like what you're about to say but i think it's almost like a if you're humanitarian right so if you're thinking if you're humanitarian you just want you know the best world for everyone so you're less likely to be kind of socially um uh, conservative because you just you, you think that you know everyone of whatever sexuality or race or whatever should just be allowed to live in peace and prosperity right mm -hmm. um so if that's the case, I think that you're probably also going to have the attitude, let's have lots of welfare and lots of robots doing stuff for us because it's it's just a better move for humanitarian reasons. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just an easier world to live in, right? It's a it's a more prosperous world, it's a happier world, it's a more equal world. Um, so I guess in that sense, toleration and liberal attitudes to things like sexuality um, will correlate with and you know find themselves in allegiance, in alliance with um, the welfare people. Mm. 
just a generally more humanitarian attitude you know less about who owns what and uh, who deserves what and more to do with just how do we make the nicest world for everyone mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah more inclusive and more welfare mm-hmm. what so you think so that would mean on the other side you'd have a mm. an anti-robot anti- anti-robot <laughs> this anti- is the civil war that's going to happen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the robots and their supporters versus the tories <laughs> so you'd have the the anti-immigration yes um, anti-robot yes the more more territorial possessive people who are sort of robots aren't taking our work and neither are foreigners um <laughs> nationalists uh socially conservatives more yeah more more narrow um nationalistic view of their identities and their place in the world less of a connection with humanity in general so, th- so these would be do you think this is very speculative yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah but so you think so the older generation would most of those things line up with the uh, anti-robot party right yes it's basically us versus our parents <laughs> and then the younger generation most of the other side yes <laughs> pretty much and guess who's going to so, win? Yeah, so well. we basically would have the Jeremy Corbyn Lo- Labour Party mm. versus the BNP, by the looks of it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the real, the real debate in the country. <laughs> I think none of those groups are going to survive. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're on their way out, both of them. <laughs> so... Um, is there anything else apart from intellectualism versus anti-intellectualism? Yeah, I think this is. I don't know whether this is really an issue. So I think, I think this is more of a consequence of not having the parties that generally represent divides. Yeah, it, it might be. So, so what we're talking about, in case anyone doesn't know how I'm using the terms intellectualism and anti-intellectualism. Um, I mean, anti-intellectualism comes in a, a number of forms and incarnations, but um, it's it's very strongly associated nowadays with people like Donald Trump and his movement, rightly or wrongly, uh, where the idea is something like um, it's a distrust of experts is one thing that it is, um, and it's a distrust of kind of evidence-based policy and fact-based policy and more of a reliance on, you know, concepts and intuitions like um, sovereignty democracy um, rather than just sort of looking at the data um, because they don't trust the data and those mm-hmm. who are producing it um, they, they, they say they can't trust the elites and by elites they don't just mean upper classes they mean intellectual elites the well educated, mm-hmm. the well read the smart people <laughs> with all the information and, and, and big brains You know, um, they feel they can't Pause. Recording. What'd you get? Ooh, a heavy rain. Yeah, oh, this, this will be fun. This is fun. <laughs> this is fun. This one here. Yeah, you should definitely do that one as well. Though. <laughs> Good. Okay, now we'll have to cut that out. Where were we? <laughs> you need to leave it in. Okay. <laughs> no one knows what I was even pointing at. <laughs> So, that one's good, but don't, don't play that one. That was rubbish. <laughs> I only have to have to see what it was and when you upload the video. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes. So distrust of expertise, distrust of uh, uh, so, and I think w- the reason why this came up is because I think that the Brexit vote uh, really reveals this this yeah. anti-intellectual attitude in Britain. Um, because if you look at the stats here, I'll put a little screenshot off of off of the the stats here. Um, <laughs> it's really, really obvious that those in the Leave camp um, have lower education. <laughs> uh, they are less likely to have degrees, mm-hmm. less likely to have formal qualifications. Um, and and of course, they're, they're older. And of course, the younger generation are much more likely to go to university now than they ever were before. Uh, nearly half of them are going to university and getting degrees. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And if you look at, I mean, I'll probably put some shots up of this as well if I've got some, but, you know, the the number of experts and, you know, informed individuals, you know, professors, economists, uh, historians, everyone you can think of with brains and information and books on their shelves said, vote remain. Mm -hmm. it, the, the list is ridiculously long yeah. of people who support this. Universities, everyone. And every major international group as well, like the International Monetary Fund, for example, you know, WHO even, <laughs> you know, um, remain is better than leave. And the result was the opposite, right? Now, when you've got all that expertise, all that evidence and information telling you to do something, and the population so votes all, all of opposite. that higher order evidence. All that higher order evidence. Yes, yes, it is. Well done, Luke. It is higher order evidence, which for anyone listening doesn't know anything about, you know, philosophical spend, terminology. Uh, thing I, I supported <laughs> this. I supported this at some point, right? Um, yeah, that worked out pretty well, that essay. That's fine. <laughs> uh, it's fine. It's an okay thing. Uh, um, it's uh, evidence of the existence of evidence. Right, okay, we don't have the evidence ourselves. We're not experts. We're not economists, we haven't seen the data. There are people who have, <laughs> and all those people say remain. So we assume that there is lots and lots of evidence telling you to remain that you haven't seen, the experts have, right? Um, that's the higher order evidence you have. Um, and you vote to leave. The majority, even, even, even if it wasn't the majority, it's only a small majority, right, votes to leave. But it's still what? How many millions? What? Seventeen million or something? Yeah, still uh, most people. Seventeen, so nearly, this. nearly yeah. seventeen and a half million ignored completely all that information because their view was, you know, oh, whatever the experts say, you know, I'm pretty sure that Great be Britain right. <laughs> be right. will be fine, you know, because we are great, you know, and and we won two world wars. And you didn't win jack <laughs> shit, right? <laughs> you know, someone else did. They're dead now, <laughs> right? Um, but they, they went with their gut, they went with their, you know, their feelings of national pride and identity, not with the facts, not with the data, not with the evidence, not with the experts, because they don't trust any of that. They trust their gut feelings. They trust vague, you know, concepts like nationality and sovereignty and Britishness. Um, that's the anti-intellectualism. But again, that divides along um, the generations. Those with mm -hmm. degrees who vote remain are following those young people with degrees who go to university are voting remain and they're following the evidence being given to them. Mm -hmm. Those less educated people from a previous generations didn't have access to the same level of education <coughs> and were far less likely to get degrees are ignoring that evidence. They don't trust it. That's Those are the anti-intellectuals. Now, to what extent, Luke, I'm going to ask you, because I don't know, <laughs> to what extent is this divide represented, if at all, by the existing parties? Uh, because both sides appealed yeah. to data, yeah. Um, but also both sides appealed to vague concepts of sovereignty on the one hand and unity on the other, you know. Um, and in the end, all of their arguments, no matter how logical or evidence-based, it didn't mean jack shit because people don't care what the experts say. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, Leave sort of had to do that because they didn't have, how, how, you can't argue didn't have any data against, to help them out. Yeah. <laughs> against all that. Yeah, yeah they, they had to. And, and I think Remain responded by doing the same thing, right? They sort of... Lee, you know, Remain put out information. Leave says, you know, forget all that. Great Britain will be fine. You know, just yeah, I underline think, I the think word that, was, great. that was more to. So they were trying to say that it was patriotic to stay in Europe and yes. fight. And I yeah. think that that was that was probably to counter. <laughs> yeah, to counter the, the Leave campaign. Counter the counter yeah. Yeah. argument from Leave. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It's it's weird. <laughs> I think that that's an example of not, they both kind of agree and disagree rather than there being a clear divide. You know, it wasn't sort of one side arguing with the facts and one side arguing with with the heart. You know, one with the head, one with the heart, which is what we have in our society. We have a, we have a genuine, I'm, I'm arguing we have a genuine line, and it's a long a generational line mostly, and a long an education line between those who are intellectual and those who are anti-intellectual. 
mm. and yet the politicians kind of sided with both and neither. They kind of used data, but they also kind of used these weird ideals as well, and they kind of mixed it around a bit. Yeah, I think they um, kind of, yeah, it, so it, to it, appeal it, to both, right? They obviously yeah. know that these kind of arguments work, these like patriotic yeah. arguments yeah. and stuff. Yeah, they know they work because they know there are people out there who aren't going to listen to a boring economic analysis of mm. how international trade works and what bonds are and what how good or good or bad it is when someone buys them all <laughs> you know yeah, this, this is kind of <laughs> and and where the house price is going down this was a great one i think good example of this is they said house prices will go down and everyone went awesome and then and then and then <laughs> and remember it was the remain who said this they said mm. don't leave house prices will go down and everyone went oh great house prices will be cheaper we can afford <laughs> to buy a house and then they went oh no um you see, I don't want to call you idiots because you won't vote for me, uh, but that's bad, <laughs> right? Because they didn't understand what that meant, <laughs> right? They don't know how, they, how the economy works. Mm. They think, yay, cheap houses, <laughs> not house pricing slump, <laughs> right? Mm. <laughs> Which is a bad thing in the world of economics, right? Um, so yeah, I think this is a genuine divide that isn't... <laughs> well, I think this, this, is, this is like a problem on top of a problem, right? The problem is... Mm. You don't have parties that represent, and then because of that, people aren't interested in what you've got to say, yeah. so you have to forget <laughs> yes. facts, etc. Yeah. Plus, I mean, you know, we have created this weird, we've created a culture that is totally distrusting of politicians, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, I, I, don't think, is... I don't think it would matter what anyone said, <laughs> right? Assume the opposite is true, you know. Proposition tells you something. Assume the opposite is true. We've created that culture. Um, we've helped to create that. Yeah, I think so. by yeah by facing for these sort of arguments, by showing them that it works, is like creating more of it, right? Yeah. If anything, it's if anything, giving people evident evidence based decisions makes them doubt. I think, I think also there's like there's no point in uh, having a referendum on evidence based right. So like if 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 the evidence is one way, you don't need to ask the people, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't ask. Them. Well, <laughs> you might think that it's an ideal world. An ideal world is where you have you know a, a, a democratic decision, mm -hmm. um, but it's an informed democratic decision. And that's that's surely the ideal. Lots and lots of people um, doing their best to form educated, informed, rational, considered views, rather than, um, you know, one oligarchy doing what they think is right, maybe getting it wrong. Mm. You know, having lots and lots of brains working on it, lots of people collaborating to come up with the best, best answer. What we actually get is a bunch of anti-intellectual idiots <laughs> who don't know anything, don't aren't know. very well informed, aren't very well, aren't very well educated. A bunch of donuts. Yeah, a bunch of donuts. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you're if you're in Bristol, you might understand that. <laughs> no, apparently, this is this is UK wide. I I've never heard this. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's okay. not but outside of London. Comment on this Bristol. video if you've like, like, comment, and subscribe if you if you've heard donuts used as uh, a pejorative term meaning idiot. <laughs> right. Okay. So you got all these idiots. Um, voting with the heart, who can't be swayed, um, and just feeling their way. Um, in which case, well, I don't want to, I don't want to say this really, but in which case, it, sod democracy. <laughs> right? yeah. If that's how you're going to vote, I mean, Jesus, just, let's just get a bunch of smart people together. Yeah, to get the out. robots in. Uh, get the robots in, in to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> this is why we need to master AI, right? Because AI will figure all of that for us. Yeah. Yeah. This is a dangerous new world. A dangerous new world. So um, is there any sort of closing? We haven't got anything else, have we? I'm, I'm stepping on your foot hard right now. <laughs> okay, so it's closing, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 30, 30 minutes, we said, 12 hours ago. Yeah, I think it's, it's like 50-something minutes, so... Whoa. We get finished before the hour. Okay, so we're going to do a summary of how all this relates. Yeah, we've already done our kind of, 
where the coalitions lie, right? Yeah. Um, except we're now only, I think I guess we need to, I guess now we just need to say something about where the last couple fit in, right? So we talked about, we talked about anti-intellectualism, so that's going to correlate with... I, th I think, I think this, to be honest, I think if we had, if we were arguing over the real things, the yeah. real divides, then you wouldn't need to make these types of arguments, right? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? I mean, so... I mean, you might be right, I'm just not sure what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so if we're arguing about what the things about like nationality or something, yeah, right? you wouldn't. The people who were, I don't think you change your mind on that. That sort of that sort of already quite an emotional issue, right? I feel like. Mm. Yeah. You're already sort of committed with your heart on all of these things, right? Because that's where the divides really lie in the population. Yeah. So if you were, if your politics these, was like, divided these along the these things. lines, you just have your voters and then the biggest group would win. I mean, like, like these are the things that people feel strongly about, right? So I think yeah. you're less likely to be mm. persuaded over. I don't, I don't think a, a, a big issue needs necessarily to be defined by how strongly people feel about it more like just sort of uh, the popularity of the view you know um, okay maybe because because I don't, I don't want a politics that's governed by the heart you know that's kind of what we have now with the anti-intellectualism right and it's terrible um, what's the point of being an academic I ask to my fellow PhD student <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what is the point of being an academic if no one's gonna listen to anything we say you know we're trying to work stuff out no one cares because they're, yeah, they're yeah. thinking with their hearts. But I mean, there's only like... <laughs> only maybe like 50 people are going to care about what we're doing anyway. <laughs> what we're doing. Yeah, but I mean, in general, you know. <laughs> I mean, in general, you know, our work <laughs> goes on and it, those 50 people have a 50 people of their own, you know, who read their stuff. And they have 50 people of their own. And, you know, it all adds up to a big... Um, you know, academic discussion and the accumulation of knowledge and wisdom. But if the outputs of that aren't being considered by politics, politicians and, and economists and the people who actually control the world, what's the point? Okay, so you think the new politics has to be these two parties and we have to re return to rational debate I think if we had rational debate, one of these parties would very quickly be annihilated. And I'll leave you to decide which one I think that is. <laughs> it's the one with all the old people in it. <laughs> for, a for, for a hint. I think that one would go pretty quickly. <laughs> I don't think it's purely old people. Though, no, it? no, but that's where they, they end up mostly in that camp. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I think if without the old people, they cease to exist, right? Yeah, they still exist, yeah, they just wouldn't be near as many of them. Would, I mean, the party wouldn't survive without the old people. No. no. It's, yeah, so I guess this whole, I guess this whole conversation then was irrelevant, right? <laughs> because I mean, I think it's quite interesting how we've thought about the things and then we've divided them up and concluded that one of them is going to survive and one of them like one set of views yeah maybe that's something to close on actually is this this point about how you know this this cluster of what well, one one half of this cluster is dying out just naturally yeah. because it's not held by young people young, young people aren't regressing to that way of thinking like i said to you, you know, they're not um reverting to that more traditionalist nationalist narrow-minded view this is, the, the, you know, the, the success of right-wing politics in the world at the moment, you know, the revival of that movement and Brexit and that kind of thing is not a symptom of a regression for young it's people. Not, it's, yeah, it's not it's, young people. Yeah, it's, it's not young people doing it. It's not, the world is not going backwards. It's mm -hmm. old people screaming into the abyss, <laughs> you know, raging against a world that has run away with liberalism and got out of control. And they don't understand it anymore. They don't like it. 
they're not familiar with it, they're scared of it, and they want it gone. And they are doing whatever they can to burn it. <laughs> and when they are gone and in the ground, there'll be no one left to fight for those old ways of thinking. And it will just fade away. I think we have we have divides among our generation as well, right? Yes, we have new divides, but that's these that's are different different to the ones we're talking about now. Whole new, uh, <laughs> because that's the that's the next video. That's the you that's that's what you got to wait next, for next, next week. week. Next week, <laughs> we okay. talk about the new divides that there'll be, yeah, not I think the ones probably, that are now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's might not be anything interesting happening next week. <laughs> of it's all Brexit stuff, which everyone's fed up with now. Everyone's fed up with this. By the time we put this video out, they're fed up with it. So 